Hello, my name is Chris Sortman. I'm the Area Director for the Milwaukee Area OSHA Office. Welcome to the 2018 Utility Damage Prevention Meeting. Each year we try and bring you information relevant to your work. We've had a couple of trenching incidents over the last two years. The cases that we're going to be reviewing today fortunately did not involve any fatalities, but given slightly different circumstances could have easily resulted in a fatality. In August of 2016, the Milwaukee OSHA office was notified by the local police department that two workers were injured when the trench they were working in collapsed. As two compliance officers responded to the accident, the workers were transported to a local hospital. On arriving at the accident scene, the compliance officers observed a manhole and sewer replacement project. The stage of the project had a 50 foot long trench, which varied in depth from 8 to over 16 feet deep. Several trench boxes were in place, but none reached to the bottom of the trench. Road plate had been used in several spots in an attempt to extend the protection. As shown by the photos, adequate protection was not provided. As workers performed their duties, a portion of the unprotected trench caved in on one worker. The crew reacted and initiated their own rescue. While attempting to get the worker out of the trench, additional soil collapsed, injuring a second worker. The foreman called 911 and the fire department got the workers out. The workers were very lucky in this case. They were treated at the hospital and released. As a result of the inspection, four citations were issued. A means of egress was not provided within 25 feet of the worker. Inspections of the site were not conducted by a competent person as required. Employees in the excavation were not protected from cave-ins by an adequate protective system. And excavated soil below the trench box exceeded two feet. We had a similar case in Lafayette County this past year. As the crew was working in the ditch, part of it collapsed. One individual was trapped. Two other workers jumped in to try to remove him and then they also became entrapped when the ditch caved in again. Oftentimes, a trench collapse will happen in stages, and the would-be rescuers become victims themselves. These trenching incidents are great examples of the need to provide adequate protection to workers in trenches. Let's first take a look at using trench boxes. Trench boxes are the most widely used type of trench protection. Remember, trenches five feet deep or greater require a protective system unless the excavation is made entirely in stable rock. If less than five feet deep, a competent person may determine that a protective system is not required. Trenches 20 feet deep or greater require that the protective system be designed by a registered professional engineer. As we saw in the accident review, to provide adequate protection for the workers, boxes cannot be more than two feet from the bottom of the trench. OSHA standards require that employers inspect trenches daily and as conditions change to ensure elimination of hazards. The inspection should include the consideration of atmospheric hazards. Also, remember that rain or water can affect the stability of the trench. If ground conditions slope towards the box, or if the box is used in conjunction with a sloping or benching system, the box will have to extend to 18 inches out of the trench. Otherwise, it can remain level with the ground. Just a rule of thumb, if something can be kicked into the box or dirt can roll back into the trench, the box would have to extend 18 inches. All excavations are required to have a safe means of exit for employees working in excavations four feet or deeper. These exit devices must be located within 25 feet of all workers. Once the box is in the hole correctly, it is important to make sure the open ends are also protected. Josh Retzleff, Safety Director with KS Energy Services, walks us through options for this box installation. Yes, yeah, so a couple of the options that we have available to us here today, uh, the use of fin forms, along with southern yellow pines stood vertically in the trench. Uh, that's going to be the option we're using here today. Uh, we've got tabulated data from our registered professional engineer certifying and stating for this depth, uh, for the size hole, for the box that we're using, and the materials that it's legal for us to uh, protect the hole in this manner. Another option that's out there as well is the use of a road plate on the ends, but again, you got to make sure that you have your tabulated data from your registered engineer certifying that that's legal. Other options that are available could be sloping or benching the ends of the hole as long as you have the room to do so. Next, we have former area director George Oaksis discussing another form of trench protection, which is using hydraulic shoring. Today we're going to uh, demonstrate and talk a little bit about one of the support systems, hydraulic shoring, some people will call it speed shoring. This is a system which uh, can be utilized that actually prevents a cave-in. Uh, unlike a shield system, a shield system protects against the effects of a cave-in in and of itself would not necessarily 
uh, stop the cave-in from, uh, from happening. One of the advantages of having a, a, a speed shoring system or uh, aluminum shores is that they can be uh, affixed, they can be put into the system without putting people into danger, generally from the top down. We now have Assistant Area Director Chad Greenwood reviewing the standards for using sloping and benching of soil in a trench. Once you choose that you're going to use sloping and benching as your method of cave-in protection while working in a trench, a competent person is going to do a soil analysis to determine whether or not they have stable rock, a type A soil, a type B soil, or even a type C soil. In order to do that analysis, they have to do at least one visual analysis and one manual analysis. For trenches that are less than 20 feet deep, based on that soil analysis you've done, you can assign the appropriate slopes. Now if you have a type A soil, your slope should be at least 3 quarters to 1. For type B soils, you're going to have a 1 to 1 slope. And for type C soils, you're going to have a 1 and a half to 1 slope. An important thing to remember when determining the appropriate slope is if you're going to measure your slope, you need to start measuring from the bottom edge of that excavation or that trench wall and measure up. In addition to sloping, another option you have is to actually bench the trench. Now a bench is actually a, a situation where you're going to step up the wall of the trench. And there's a couple different benches you can do. There's a simple bench and there's a multiple bench. A simple bench is where you put in one bench where you can come up vertically approximately four feet then you go horizontally approximately four feet to, to make like a step. If your trench is deeper than four feet then from there you can apply the appropriate slope moving up the rest of the way of the trench. Another option you have is the multiple bench uh, where you would do the same thing except that when you make that first horizontal step of four feet now you're going to start benching up but you've got to make sure that you keep those benches behind that slope line. So if you've got that type B soil you are still maintaining that slope it's just that you're putting steps in. One key point to remember is that benching is something that's not allowed in, in type C soils. Our national office has developed a quick card which provides tips for trench safety. Before you get in that trench, ensure it has been sloped, shielded, or properly shored. Excavated dirt is at least two feet from the edge. There is a safe way to exit. And a competent person has inspected the trench for your safety. Now we're going to have Jim Lutz, Compliance Assistance Specialist out of the Milwaukee OSHA office, talk about OSHA's new silica standard. And I feel it to be my duty to make this report available to the working people of the United States and to their employers. This report shows how silicosis occurs, where it occurs, and what the disease is. The report emphasizes that these control measures, if conscientiously adopted and applied, that silicosis can be prevented. When I first seen Francis Perkins' video, I was just outraged that in 1938, 60 experts spent just a year to figure it out and to really make it simple, turn the water on or turn the vac on. My dad was a sandblaster for several years in his late 20s. Shortly after that, he became short of breath. We didn't know what it was. He had a couple collapsed lungs. And then finally the diagnosis came, it was silicosis. It took about five years to kill him. And we got to watch. The toughest thing was watching him come home when he couldn't work no more. And literally fell on the ground and cried. They didn't know then, and most people don't know now about the hazards of working around silica, dry grinding and cutting and polishing material that produces silica dust. As we saw in the video, the hazard of respirable crystalline silica exposure has been known for decades. Breathing crystalline silica dust can cause silicosis, which in severe cases can be disabling or even fatal. When silica dust enters the lungs, it causes formation of scar tissue, making it difficult for the lungs to take in oxygen. There's no cure for this disease. 
Silicosis typically occurs after 15 to 20 years of exposure to silica dust. Symptoms may or may not be obvious. As the disease progresses, the worker may experience shortness of breath upon exercising. In later stages, affected workers may experience fatigue, extreme shortness of breath, chest pain, or even respiratory failure. Because silicosis affects the immune system, exposure to silica also increases the risk of lung infections such as tuberculosis. In rare instances, individuals exposed to very high concentrations of silica dust can develop symptoms including fever and weight loss within weeks instead of years. OSHA's final silica rule was published in 2016 and became effective for private sector workers in September of 2017. The rule was updated because epidemiological evidence exists that lung cancer and silicosis can occur at exposure levels previously thought to be safe. The standard requires employers to limit worker exposures to silica dust and to take other steps to protect workers. The standard provides flexible alternatives, especially for small employers. Employers can either use the control methods laid out in Table 1 of the construction standard, or they can monitor workers' exposure to silica and independently decide which dust controls work best to limit exposures in their workplace. Regardless of which exposure control method is used, all construction employers covered by the standard are required to establish and implement a written exposure control plan that identifies tasks that involve exposure and methods used to protect workers including procedures to restrict access to work areas where high exposures may occur, designate a competent person to implement the written exposure control plan, restrict housekeeping practices that expose workers to silica where feasible alternatives are available, offer medical exams including chest x-rays and lung function tests every three years for workers who are required by the standard to wear a respirator for 30 or more days per year. Train workers on work operations that result in silica exposure and ways to limit exposure. Keep records of workers' silica exposure and medical exams. Additional information on OSHA silica rule can be found at www.osha.gov slash silica. OSHA's on-site consultation or WISCON program offered through the Wisconsin Occupational Health Lab can offer free occupational safety and health services to assist employers in complying with the new rule. It should be noted that public employers are still subject to the silica rule outlined in the 2010 OSHA standards as adopted by the state of Wisconsin, which establishes a permissible exposure level of 250 micrograms per cubic meter of air for an eight hour day. Thank you, Jim. There are a variety of good resources of information on construction and excavation safety. OSHA provides a variety of resources through its webpage, including our video tools, or through specific training programs offered through the Susan Harwood Grant Program. You can also implement safe digging practices as suggested by the Common Ground Alliance. If you are an employer or employee and have questions about workplace safety, you can contact your area OSHA office for more information. A contact sheet is available at the Diggers Hotline or OSHA table. Occupational safety and health for all public sector employees in Wisconsin, including city and county workers, is enforced by the Division of Industry Services, which is part of the Department of Safety and Professional Services. Enforcement is based on the 2010 OSHA standards, but there are some requirements that do go beyond the OSHA standards. Consultations and inspections are provided by industry services staff. A public sector worker handout with contact information is available for city and county workers today. In closing, I'd like to thank Diggers Hotline and KS Energy Services for making this video possible. I'm Chris Sortman, and have a safe year.